here an amazing fact. The biggest doors in the world are on Merritt Island, Florida. And it's the VAB, that's the Nassau Vehicle Assembly Building, where they roll in and roll out those giant rockets. Those doors are 456 feet high. That means those doors are tall enough for you to roll in the Empire State Building and still have 150 feet left over. You know, the Bible talks about a door that Jesus has left open for us in Revelation. It also tells us that he stands at the door and knocks. And that's a door big enough for everybody who wants to come to Christ. We're going to talk about it today in this presentation of Revelation Now. <laughs> friends, we'd like to welcome all of you to Revelation Now. Everything is about to change. This is our final presentation in the series of uh, lectures looking at the most important prophecies that you can find anywhere in the Bible. We'd like to welcome all of those who are joining us across the country and around the world, as well as those who are meeting in church groups this morning. I'd like to extend a happy Sabbath to all of those who are watching today. We'd like to remind you that we are translating this presentation live into Spanish, and if that'll be a blessing or a help to you, just visit the Amazing Facts Latino Facebook page, as well as the YouTube channel. You'll be able to get the Spanish translation. Uh, we're also going to be uh, doing sign language for the deaf, and that is available at the Revelation Now website. Following the presentation this morning, we're going to be taking your Bible questions. This will be the final time that we'll be able to take your Bible questions in this program. So if you have a Bible-related question, type it there in the comment section on Facebook. That's the Amazing Facts Facebook page or the Doug Batchelor Facebook page. We'll try and answer as many of those questions as possible. We'd also like to just thank the many people who are involved in helping to make this program such a wonderful success. We'd like to thank our media team here at Amazing Facts for the many hours of hard work that they have put into the program. We'd also like to thank the translators who are translating into different languages, as well as those working on the slides and the graphics and everything else that is involved in this program. We'd like to thank our partners at 3ABN, both 3ABN English as well as 3ABN Latino, as well as the Amazing Facts uh, television channel for broadcasting this live and making it available to people literally around the world. So a big thank you for all of those who have helped to make these programs a success. We have a greeting that we would like to make to those who are watching in Kuwait and Bulgaria today. We've been hearing from people around the world who have been tuning in. We've been trying to mention the different countries that we've heard from. So today it's Kuwait and Bulgaria. Happy Sabbath to those of you who are watching from there. A few testimonies that have come in. We have Kalina from British Columbia. She said, I've been a Christian for many years and I'm very grateful for your program. I had the false belief that it's okay to have an occasional alcoholic beverage. However, after watching your program last night, the King's Ambassador, I have made up my mind to not drink alcohol anymore. So amen for that. And then we'd also like to greet uh, Delphine and the uh, Beaver Creek uh, Church in Dayton, Ohio. We want to, they say thank you for these amazing programs. They have been a great blessing to our church. And we'd also like to greet the other churches that are meeting this Sabbath morning. Now we want to remind you about some upcoming events that Amazing Facts is going to do. Even though this series is finishing today, we're hoping that you'll still continue to study God's Word. And we have a few exciting events that you might want to mark down on your calendar. First of all, we have a special youth weekend rally that will be taking place March the 18th through the 20th, 2021. And it's entitled Undaunted Courage. And if you'd like to learn more about that, just visit afyouth.com. That's the website, afyouth.com. We're going to be focusing on some great presentations dealing with issues relating to young people and youth. Uh, we're going to invite people to come in from the area. You're welcome to fly in if you'd like to spend the whole weekend with us. Hopefully COVID will allow at that point in time. But mark that down. You'll hear more about it as we get closer. That's March 18 through 20. And then something very special. Amazing Facts has a program called AFCO. AFCO is the Amazing Facts Center of Evangelism. It's the training part of our ministry. And we have a number of online classes that we provide for people. But in connection with the Revelation Now series, uh, the AFCO program has decided to make one of our courses absolutely free for anyone 
who wants to register as part of the Revelation Now series. Uh, the program is Amazing Doctrines. It's a full e-course that's available online, and uh, usually there's a cost associated with that, but we're going to provide that for free. And all you'll have to do is visit the online course, and that's AFCO. You can go to uh, online.afco.org. You select Amazing Doctrines, and this is what you want to remember. Remember the code REV lowercase now. That's rev lowercase now. And you'll be able to register for free for this 13-part series. This program includes weekly Zoom meetings and uh, Facebook Live classes with various instructors. Pastor Doug's teaching. I'm teaching. We have Pastor Carlos that's there. Daniel's teaching. And a number of other guest teachers that are participating in this program. So I hope you'll take advantage of that. I think it's going to be available for about a week or so. So if you want to register and take advantage of that class, we want to encourage you to do so as soon as possible. Well, of course, our lesson today, a very important uh, lesson, it's entitled, The Goal of the Godly. And we have a lesson that goes along with the presentation today. And you can find this, it's at the Revelation Now website. And if you'd like to receive this, just go to revelationnow.com, download the lesson, The Goal of the Godly, and you'll be able to follow along with the presentation. And then we also have a study guide entitled No Turning Back. And this is our free offer available to anyone here in North America in a digital download format. All you have to do is text the word TURN to the number 40544 and you'll be able to get a digital download. If you're outside of North America, you can just go to the revelationnow.com website and you'll be able to download the study guide No Turning Back. And I think you'll enjoy reading that. It's got a lot of great scripture there. And so I think you'll find that a blessing. Well, at this time, we'd like to invite Pastor Doug to come forward as we prepare for our final presentation in this Revelation Now series. And Pastor Doug, we've heard from people who have participated in the programs, and some of the folks have missed one or two of the programs. And we just want to encourage them to go to the Revelation Now website where we have everything archived. Amen. And folks will be able to go and pick the one you haven't seen. I encourage you to watch it. You'll also see decision cards on the various nights Go ahead and fill that in. We want to pray for you in a special mm -hmm. way if you've made a decision for Christ. And again, we're just grateful for the wonderful testimonies that are coming in as a result of the preaching of the Word. So let's have a word of prayer and we'll get right mm -hmm. to it. Dear Father in heaven, again, we thank you for this opportunity and thank you for the Sabbath where we can gather together and we can study your Word. We ask your blessing upon those who are joining us. We know there are people gathered together in churches or in homes or individuals watching by themselves. And we ask that it's a blessing uh, Give us clarity in the understanding of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Ross. Looks like we both got the memo about the blue suit and striped tie so today. <laughs> and, you know, we also want to give a special greeting to the members of our church, Pastor Ross, Pastor um, Carlos, Pastor Todd, Pastor Brumman, Pastor Lucas. We pastor a church here in Granite Bay. They're meeting across the parking lot from where we're recording this right now, we know that we got a small group gathered over there and we want to let them know that we see you and that uh, we're going to be over there to greet you following the program today. You know, friends, uh, we have so much to share. Uh, we have just really skimmed the surface. There's a lot of subjects in Revelation we just did not have time to get into. And we hope you'll take advantage of the revelationnow.com website because we're going to continue to upload information there add lessons that maybe we, di we did not have time to study, and you'll want to link that and share it with your friends because we want these truths of the three angels' message to go around the world. Uh, something else I just want to share uh, for clarity is sometimes you'll see in my presentations, I customize things a little bit. It may not match perfectly with a lesson. There'll always be more information, more references in the lesson, so use those. And uh, But when I preach and I present, I kind of modify things a little bit for my own uh, ease and benefit. But um, our lesson, as we shared today, is called The Goal of the Godly. And we're going to go to Revelation. And in Revelation chapter 14, you remember we've got those three angels' messages that go to the world. Revelation 14 talks about the hundred and the forty-four thousand that follow the Lamb wherever he goes. And it contrasts two groups. One has the seal of God, and then that third angel's message says, boy, if any man worships a beast in his image and receives his mark on his hand or his forehead, 
the same will drink the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. So you've got the most fearful curse in Scripture is pronounced against those who worship the beast in his image. Then it contrasts that group with the other group of the redeemed. And they're identified here in Revelation 14, 12. It tells us, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So in the last days, those who are going to make it, they've got patience, and that word patience means endurance. They hang on. You know, one of the most important factors in being a Christian is not just, uh, you know, living right and following God, but if you fall, don't give up. You endure. Jesus says, he that endures to the end will be saved. And so you want to hang on. It also says that they've got, uh, they keep the commandments. They don't just read them. They're wanting to be doers of the word. And they have the faith, not in Jesus. You notice it says they have the faith of Jesus. Because they've got the Holy Spirit and the mind of Christ, they have the faith of Jesus. You know, I thought that uh, in our story for our study today, we're going to take a look at uh, one of my, well, I'll call him a hero. I guess it's better to say I identify with him. And that is the Apostle Peter. Peter is certainly one of the most outspoken of the apostles. He was uh, always famous for, as they say, he would uh, have his mouth in gear before his brain was engaged. And Peter was always talking, and then he'd think later. But he was very bold. He always knew where he stood. And first we find that Jesus is walking by the Sea of Galilee, and he sees these four brothers. And they're out, uh, you know, separating fish and cleaning their nets. And you've got Peter and his brother Andrew, James and his brother John. And Jesus wants to preach. So he says, can I borrow your boat? Because the crowd was kind of pressing him right down into the water. And you could have a better amphitheater from the boat. So he takes the boat. Peter puts him in his boat. He pushes off a little bit. He preaches. And when he's done, Jesus said, well, Peter, I see you don't have very many fish. He says, why don't you launch out and we'll let down the net. And Peter's thinking, Lord, you're a good preacher and probably a fine carpenter, but you don't know much about fishing. We fished all night. We don't, didn't catch anything. And you don't fish in these parts in the daytime. And Jesus looked at him and he said, but at your word, Peter said, I'll, I'll, I'll do it if you want me to. And so they went out a little bit and they dropped their nets. And the Bible says that there were so many fish in the net, they had to beckon to their partners to help. And the nets were bursting. And there was, it was the biggest catch he'd ever seen in his life. And here he caught it at a time they never would expect to catch it. Peter suddenly realized he was in the presence of someone supernatural. And he fell down at Jesus' feet and he said, Lord, depart from me. I am a sinful man. And he didn't really want him to depart, but he said, I've got to warn you, if, if you're doing this wonderful miracle for me, do you know who I am? I am a swearing, cursing sailor. And Jesus said, do not fear, follow me, and I will make you a fisher of men. So the wonderful thing to remember is God takes imperfect people and invites them to follow him. And he says, if you follow me, you will be transformed in the following process. It doesn't always happen overnight. You can see a dramatic conversion, but sometimes there's still things to learn. And we see that in the life of Peter. Peter always wanted to be close to Jesus. And when Jesus was performing miracles, Peter wanted to be there. And he was so excited when he was chosen to be one of the apostles. Uh, Jesus recognized he had great potential of leadership. Uh, Peter was not afraid to step out of the boat. You remember when they saw Jesus walking on the water during the storm. And all the other disciples were afraid. And Peter said, Lord, if that's you, bid, invite me to come to you on the water. I mean, who else would say that? And Jesus said, well, come. Since you ask, you'll receive. Come. Peter steps out of the boat and he starts putting his feet down. And sure enough, it's solid. And he starts to walk on the water through the stormy waves to Jesus. And halfway there, he thinks, I wonder if my friends are catching this on their phones. I hope they're getting a video of this. i got to put this on my Facebook post. Not too many people do this. And when he turns away from Jesus to look and see if his friends are watching, in the process, he took his eyes off Christ. He saw the wind and the waves. And he thought, I'm out here in the dark ocean. I could drown. And what happens if I stop walking on water? And his faith began to sink, and he began to sink. And that's when Peter prayed one of the shortest prayers in the Bible. Three words, Lord, save me. 
And Jesus heard his prayer. By the way, you don't always have to kneel when you pray. You can swim and pray, which is what Peter was doing. And he brought him back to the boat, and he said, why did you doubt? And, but Peter loved Jesus, but he also liked the crowd. He always wanted to be uh, in the middle of it all. In fact, at the Last Supper, when Jesus said, one of you is going to betray me, Peter said, well, though all men should betray you, I will not betray you. And Jesus said to Peter, John 13, 38, he said, I tell you, the rooster, the cock shall not crow till you have denied me three times. Another gospel, it says, the rooster will not have crowed twice before you deny me three times. And you know what happened. Peter said, though I die with you, I'll not deny you. And he meant it. He just didn't know his own heart. That same night, after Judas came into the Garden of Gethsemane and betrayed Christ, when the soldiers were going to arrest Jesus, Peter is the one who pulled out a sword. He really was willing to die for Christ. But uh, when Jesus said, Peter, put away your sword, those that live by the sword will die by the sword, he didn't know what to do. So he followed Jesus as he was taken off to trial. But you know, the Bible says something interesting about Peter. He did follow Jesus, but he followed from a distance. A lot of people say, I want to be a Christian. I want to go to church. I want to follow Christ. But they still want the world. So they follow from a distance. You know, you get in trouble doing that. So they took Jesus into the judgment hall. And when he was being tried, Peter stayed outside with the servants of the high priest and the enemies of Christ. Tried to just mix in and hopefully not be noticed as they warmed themselves around the fire that night. And then one of the girls asked him mockingly, Oh, that Galilean, that false prophet in there, you're one of his followers. And Peter, worried about the ridicule of others, he suddenly found Jesus, who he was going to die for a few minutes earlier. Now he's denying he even knows him. He began to finally, after the third time someone said, Are you one of his disciples? You surely are. You've got a Galilean accent. And he began to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man. Deny Jesus with swearing and cursing. When the time came for Christ to be crucified, Peter was overwhelmed with shame. See, when Peter denied Jesus three times, Jesus turned and looked at him. And the Bible says he went out and he wept bitterly. He realized he had denied the Lord. And when Jesus was crucified, it says the disciples stood off afar, watching from a distance. Again, he was intimidated by the crowd. But then, showing the mercy of the Lord, you realize that... Um, when Jesus rose from the dead and he spoke to Mary Magdalene, Mark 16, 7, he said to Mary, go tell the disciples and Peter. Notice who he specifically mentions. Peter thought, I've gone too far. Jesus is never going to forgive me. Go tell the disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee and he'll see you. you see, the Lord wants us to know that he sees when we're sorry. Peter went out and he wept bitterly. He was brokenhearted that he had denied the Lord. He did not forget him. And then you can read in the upper room when Jesus appeared. He appeared to Peter. Show up, she'd lock him out and he'd start bellowing out in the street. I love you, I love you. And one night she got rather fed up and she put her head out the second story window. She said, I've got two words for you. Prove it. There's a lot of people that say, I love you, I love you. But they keep drinking Babylon's wine. They keep on following the devil. And, you know, the way we show God we love him is really by giving him first place in our lives and obeying him. He that says, I know him and keeps not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Now, I have a lot of people that say, oh yeah, I love the Lord and I serve the Lord, but uh, you don't really have to keep all the commandments. What does James say about that? James 2.10. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. And I know during this program, we've you know, made it a point to emphasize all ten commandments. There are a couple of commandments that many churches are ignoring, and so we accentuate those a little more. A lot of churches are bowing down to idols. God says, don't do that. The people who worship the image of the beast in the last days, that's sort of like a, a religious idolatry taking place. And many people have given up on giving God their holy time, keeping the Sabbath day every seventh day. And so we accentuate that. And I've got some Christian friends in other churches, and they say, Brother Doug, 
we love the Lord. Just because we're not keeping this one commandment doesn't mean that we don't love the Lord. But, uh, you know, Jesus is not giving us multiple choice in the Ten Commandments. Oh, he doesn't give us a 10% discount. They're not called the Ten Recommendations or the Ten Suggestions. These are the commandments of God. And Jesus said, Whosoever therefore shall break the least of these commandments, Matthew chapter 5, he will be called least by those in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever will do and teach them every commandment of God that we ignore, we suffer for. And so I know this is not popular, and many Christians are convicted by this, but it's in the Bible, friends. You've got to decide, am I going to follow the Bible or man-made religion? If you're going to follow the word of God, he wants you to keep all ten. Uh, you break one, it's like breaking the link of a chain. You can't go to the judge and say, Judge, I realize I murdered somebody, but I keep all the other commandments. So just uh, let's let it go this time. He's going to say, no, you've got to keep that one. And so it's that way with all of them. According to Jesus, why did the hypocrites act religious? It says that they may have the glory of men. They're more concerned with what people thought about them. This is the problem that Peter was struggling with. That they might have the glory of men. That they might be seen of men. Jesus said that people can do very religious things. They can fast to be seen. They can pray to be seen. They can give offerings to be seen. And they're doing all these things. And you think, well, how religious they are. But uh, what the Lord really wants is our heart. Even if we're like that publican that stands in the back of the church and smites on our breast and says, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus said, that man goes to his house justified, not the Pharisee who says, I pay tithe and I fast and I do all these religious things. We're saved by surrender. If you are fully surrendered, then you will obey and you won't have to have a hypocritical religion. Is it generally safe to follow the crowd? What does Moses tell us? Exodus 23, verse 2. Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. I think it was Winston Churchill that said, if a million people believe a dumb idea, it is still a dumb idea. And just because everybody, you might say, but isn't everybody believing differently? Don't all the other Christians keep Sunday as a holy day? They may, but what did Jesus do? Whenever you're in doubt about what to do, say, what did Jesus do? And, you know, then it really clears up everything. In the judgment day, when I stand before the Lord, uh, I always want to do the safe thing and I want to do the biblical thing. Uh, if you're in doubt, how much jewelry should a Christian wear? Well, I know the easy answer to that. Don't wear any, right? How much alcohol should a Christian drink? I'm not in trouble because I don't eat, drink any. And so if there's anything that has the appearance of evil, stay away. And the other question is, what would Jesus do in the judgment when God says, Doug, why did you worship on the seventh day of the week? I'll say, well, Lord, because you commanded it. You wrote it with your finger. You spoke it with your voice. And I want to follow you. It's what Jesus did. You're never in trouble if you do what Jesus did. Don't follow a multitude. The Bible tells us, Matthew 7, verse 13 and 14, Enter ye in at the straight gate. And that word straight there, it doesn't necessarily mean straight up and down. It means it's austere, the difficult, the challenging gate. Enter in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many there be that go in thereat. Now that simply means the majority are on the wrong road going the wrong way. Do not follow the majority. Um, so many people get in trouble, even in Christ's day. The Jews said among themselves, if this is the Messiah, how come the religious leaders don't recognize it? Now, have you heard that before? That's going to happen again in the last days. How come the doctors of theology aren't agreeing? The, how could they be wrong? Why are there so many other churches that are lovely people that do things differently? So if you want to know what the truth is, what's the best criteria? What does the Bible say is the answer. Amen? Because, Jesus goes on, straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to life and few there be that find it. Now, keep in mind in Bible times, um, when people were going into a uh, city, that's where they went in the event of there was a war, they were threatened by another nation. And they could always see an approaching army. They usually had some signal system. They'd use smoke signals at, in the day or fire signals at night or they'd have trumpets that would blow and they'd say, there's an army approaching, take refuge. 
And some people, they'd say, oh, they've given the signal that we need to take refuge in the city. They'd say, well, I got to go back to my house and I got to get my bags packed and I got to do this and do this. And everybody would get on the wide road with all their wagons and they'd want to take the easy way into the city. They'd often get shut out and caught by the invading army. But if you were serious and you knew there was only one narrow gay way to salvation, you'd go right up. He wouldn't take that wide meandering road. You'd take the road that was straight up the hill. It was steep. And you'd go through that crack in the wall just big enough for a man. Uh, an enemy horse couldn't get through there. And this is the picture that Jesus is painting. Is you drop everything and you run. Christ said in the last days when the time comes to flee, don't even go back to your house and get your coat. Don't come off your roof if you're up on the roof to go inside your house. But you run for the hills. And that's the way it is with salvation. It's like he told Lot and his family, do not look back. Well, friends, as it was in the days of Noah, as it was in the days of Lot, we need to get out of Sodom. We need to get into the ark because, and that's the ark of God's church because we are living in the last days. In the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, we're in few that is, eight souls were saved by water. Now, is God saying that there'll only be eight people saved? And I should mention here, some folks say, Pastor Doug, will there only be 144,000 saved in the last days? Well, I've got good news for you. Uh, no, there's more than that. Um, I did the math once, and if only 144,000 people are saved, there's about 8 billion people, I think 7.8 billion right now in the world. Uh, that means your chances are approximately 1 in 50,000. That's better than the lottery, but it's still, that would be discouraging. If you had a group of 50,000 people and you said only one of these people is going to be saved, that'd be discouraging. But you read in Revelation chapter 7 and 14, it tells us that through the influence of the 144,000, there is a great multitude that no man can number that comes out of the great tribulation. I think through their, their preaching, just like through the apostles, you read Pentecost, there's a great multitude that are baptized. So there's going to be others saved. Jesus is coming for a harvest, but will it be the majority or the minority? It's going to be the minority. When Jesus sent a 12 spies to check out the promised land, how many came back and said, we can take it? Two out of 12. I like that ratio better than eight out of a million. But uh, still, they were the minority report. But they're the ones that had faith. And because they had faith that God could bring them into the promised land, Joshua and Caleb made it to the promised land. Number six, how does Jesus feel when we put the traditions of men before the commandments of God? Howbeit in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. He said, full well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your own tradition." There's a lot of people out there, they say, well, Pastor Doug, uh, you know, we've been going to church on Sunday. This has been a tradition for 2,000 years. And I don't, I don't doubt that. It's actually not been that long, closer to 1,700 years. But uh, do you want to follow the commandments of God or the traditions of men? doesn't matter how long the tradition is. If it goes against the commandment of God, you need to follow the commandments of God and not the traditions of men. What does Jesus say? He said, in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men, and full well you reject the commandment of God that you might keep your own tradition. Jesus came to throw off the man-made traditions. This is what God wants his people to do in the last days. See, well, let's not follow these, all these pagan trappings that have come into Christianity. A lot of people are in Babylon. They've been drinking the wine of Babylon, and they are drunk on the wine of Babylon. But if you're in a church that teaches that you die and you go to hell and burn forever and ever, uh, that's Babylon. If you're in a church that teaches that uh, it doesn't, it, you can be saved by your works, you can work your way to heaven, that's Babylon. If you're in a church that teaches that uh, really God changed the Ten Commandments so that now the first day of the week is a new holy day, I say, where is the commandment for that? Show me the scripture where it's commanded. There is none. You're following the traditions of men. That's the earmarks of Babylon. And God in the last days is calling his people out of Babylon. He's got his people. Other sheep I've got that are not of this fold, but there will be one fold and one shepherd. And we need to be courageous. It's not always easy, but take that step of faith. Will true Christianity be popular in the last days? What does the Bible say? Jesus, Matthew 24, verse 9. You will be hated 
of all nations for my name's sake. Who gets the mark of the beast? He causes all, small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark. This is going to be a global problem. And so if we're waiting for our Christianity to be uh, popular, it is never going to be popular. Let me say one more thing while I'm on the subject. A lot of people say, Pastor Doug, what you're saying makes sense. It's true. And uh, I know I need to make some changes, but, um, uh, you know, it's just an inconvenient time in my life right now. Going through a lot of stress and some of my family and friends, they won't understand. And, and you know, I'm just going to wait until things smooth out, especially, you know, this year with a pandemic and the economic uncertainty. I, I just, I don't want to rock the boat. And so I'm going to wait a little bit. That is one of the devil's most popular um, diversions called procrastination. And uh, the best time to listen to God's voice is when you're hearing God's voice. The best time to follow the Lord is when you're hearing him. He said, now is the acceptable time. Today is the day of salvation. When Jesus called people, he called Peter, Andrew, James, and John. They walked away right then and there from their fishing nets. He called Matthew Levi. He got up and walked away from the cash register. When the Lord calls people, they say, Lord, I'm coming and I'm coming now. So it is a dangerous thing to say, I, you know, that makes sense, Pastor Doug. One of these days, one of these days never seems to come. It's never going to be popular. It'll never be convenient. You make up your mind when God calls you to take the first step. And even though it might seem impossible, he will start moving mountains and parting oceans and make it possible for you to follow him. You take the first step and watch what happens. Yea, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. If we want to follow the Lord, it tells us that we're going to suffer persecution. Now, you might be thinking, Pastor Doug, I don't want to be persecuted. Let me read this verse and then I'll talk about that. Revelation 12, 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and he went to make war with the remnant of her seed that uh, keeps the commandments of God and has the testimony of Jesus. It tells us in the last days the beast power will cause as many as will not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So there is persecution. Some of you are thinking, you know, life's tough enough. I don't know if I want to be a Christian. Sounds like it's hard to be a Christian. Listen carefully, please. This is very important. Life is hard. There are problems in life. If you're looking for a life without problems, then just keep, there is nowhere to go really. <laughs> So you've got two choices. You can serve the devil and deal with the wrath of the lamb, according to Revelation. Or you can serve God and deal with the wrath of the devil. And that's in Revelation chapter 12. Satan's come down with great wrath because he knows his time is short. The wicked are going to run from the wrath of the lamb and he that sits upon the throne. So the question is, which side do you want to be on? Do you want to experience the wrath of the devil because you're following Christ or you want the wrath of God because you're following the devil? So I would much rather please the Lord. And you know what? It is better for a Christian. There are troubles in life, but it's better for the Lord. The Bible tells us in Ecclesiastes that though a righteous man might seem to prosper, I know in the end it will be well with the righteous. It will not be well with the wicked. There is no rest for the wicked. Those who worship the beast in his image have no rest day or night. And, but there is rest. Jesus has come to me and I will give you rest. Is there temptation if you follow Christ? Even after the baptism of Jesus, the devil came after him. And if some of you take your stand and you decide to follow Jesus, you may deal with some temptation. But Jesus fought every temptation by saying, it is written, it is written, it is written. And then the devil left him. And there is an episode of peace. So you're going to have those times of peace and joy and you're going to have some trials. All that live godly will suffer persecution. It's just a fact. If you live ungodly, you're going to suffer from no peace in your mind and other problems. Is it possible to serve both God and the crowd? No. <laughs> Matthew 6, 24, Jesus said, No man can serve two masters. Someone once asked Benjamin Franklin if he could show him one scripture that says a man can't have more than one wife. The man was arguing for polygamy. And Franklin said, yeah, no man can serve two masters. For either he will hate one and love the other, or else he will hold to one and despise the other. And you can't serve God and money. Jesus said, he that is not with me is against me. So you all have to make up your mind. I'm either going to be with Christ or with the devil. 
There is no neutral territory in the Bible story. Once you know the truth, it's, you, you've really got a choice. To say no to the light is to say yes to the darkness. To say no to Jesus and his peace is to say yes to the devil and his bondage. And so you have to decide which you want. And the devil often uh, deceives people into thinking, I'm just going to do my own thing. If you're not doing Jesus' thing, you are doing the devil's thing. There is no middle ground. And uh, by the way, if you read the end of the book, the devil loses. Is it safe to, mo to love a friend or family member more than Jesus? He that loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, Christ said. And he that loves a daughter or son more than me is not worthy of me. Christ also said, if any man comes to me and hate not, and what he means by that is love less, hate not his father or his mother, his wife and his children, his brethren, his sisters, yea, he cannot, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, that basically eliminates everything. Nothing can be more important to you than Jesus. And that makes sense. If someone gives you a wonderful gift, what do you love more, the gift or the giver? You would think you'd love the gift. Who gives you the gift of life? Who gives you your family? Who gives you anything? And I, I remember one time a uh, sister was coming to a meeting like this and, and she was postponing her decision. And I said, what's going on? She said, well, you know, I, I'd love to come to church, but that's the day my, my husband likes to go shopping and, and you know, and I, I want to protect our relationship. And she kept putting her family first. And I can understand that struggle. But then one day she called me up. She said, Pastor, can you come to the hospital and pray for my husband? He was in an accident at work and the man was nearly dead. He got crushed. And I went and saw him in the hospital and prayed for him, prayed for the sister. And she was crying. She says, God has shown me I was putting somebody ahead of him and he could take them away. I'm going to put Jesus first. And she did. And then her husband started coming to church also. And so the best thing you can do for the ones you love is to put Jesus first. If you really love them, don't put them first. If you really love them, put God first. And by your example, you're encouraging them to go to heaven with you. But if you postpone that, you're saying it's not a priority. You send the wrong signal to them. Whoever will do the will of my father, Jesus said, you want to be part of the family of Christ? Whoever does the will of my father, which is in heaven, the same is my brother and my sister and my mother. We become part of the household of Christ when we do the will of God. Is it wise to put a prosperous career or earthly treasures before Jesus? What is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? You know, I, uh, I know another uh, Christian gentleman had great gifts in, in evangelism and public speaking. And he said, you know, Brother Doug, he said... Uh, what I'm going to do, he says, I'm going to go out in the business world. I've got this great business opportunity, and I think I can make a lot of money very quickly. And he was being called to evangelism, and I knew that. And he, he knew it. He had the gifts. And he said, but I'm going to I'll make a lot of money, and after I make a lot of money, I'm going to use it to subsidize Christian work, and then I'll go into full-time evangelism. I said, brother, if you don't do it now, you're, you're, you're getting yourself into a trap. He said, if you don't do it now, you're probably never going to do it. And that was 30 years ago. And uh, he's now retired, and he never did go into Christian ministry. Made a lot of money. I'm not so sure how close to the Lord he is right now. And so a lot of people, they, they get caught up in the materialism the devil offers them. Because money is power. The Bible tells us that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Jesus made it clear, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses. And there are so many people in the world today that are in bondage to their possessions. They can't go on a mission trip. Someone's got to stay home and take care of their stuff. What if someone steals their stuff? They got to work extra harder to ensure their stuff and buy alarms to protect their stuff. And the devil has gotten our society so materialistic and we want to buy what all of our neighbors have and buy the latest gadgets and all the, the best things until we have no money for missions, for preaching the gospel. And we're just being smothered in stuff. I know some people, they're actually addicted to mine. You go to their homes, they're in debt. 
Their garages are full of boxes, things they bought at Amazon. They haven't even opened yet. And compulsively, they're buying, buying, buying. It's like they're drowning in stuff. You know, Christ told us, take up your cross and follow me. He'd sent out the disciples preaching. And I'm not saying he wants everyone to you know, unload and liquidate. But sometimes we get where these things distract us. I know a lot of people that say, I would go on a mission trip, but I can't. I have to take care of my pets. Well, I, I've got pets too. I love them. But if you're putting your pets ahead of the Lord, then I think that's a wrong priority. I'm going to get letters on that. I'm almost sure. Is it safe to continue disobeying God after he has shown us the truth? My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. He goes on to say, seeing that you've forgotten the law of your God, I will forget your children. That's pretty serious. You know, it's not just that they don't know, they're rejecting the opportunity to know. And it says specifically in this verse in Hosea 6, because they reject the law. It's a dangerous thing. I, I preach the law. And people say, Pastor Doug, the great commandment now is we just love the Lord. If we love the Lord, we don't need the law. And I said, well, technically, if you really love the Lord, love is the fulfilling of the law because if you love your neighbor, you will keep those first, or those last six commandments. If you love the Lord, you'll keep the first four commandments. So if you say, I love the Lord, and you're not keeping his commandments, uh, you're a liar according to the Bible. Anyone who says, I love him, and keeps not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him according to 1 John. And so this is a, a dangerous approach. If we sin willfully after we've received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. So what that simply means is that it doesn't mean that if you, after you know the truth, if you sin, you're doomed. Some people get discouraged by that verse. It means if you continue to practice a known sin after you know it, what else is God going to do for you? Uh, there, there's no salvation for those who say, I know what God wants, but I'm not going to do what God wants. I'm just going to keep on deliberately disobeying. There will be people in heaven that had too many wives, like Abraham, Solomon, Jacob, David. They didn't know. God winked at their ignorance. There'll be people in heaven that may have smoked. They may have um, eaten unclean food and gone to church on the wrong day. There's going to be all kinds of people in heaven that lived up to the light they had because they didn't know. But the Bible says at the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now he commands men everywhere to repent. When we know the truth, he expects us to walk in the light. Jesus said, if you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. And so it's not just knowing, he wants us to do it. So it's a yeah, dangerous thing for us to postpone that. What will happen to those who persist in rejecting the truth? It says, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Now, let me just pause here. Paul is describing a group that perish. When they heard the truth, they did not love the truth. It's like that seed that Jesus tells in the parable that is scattered and it falls on different paths and because they don't nurture and embrace the truth and cultivate it so that it brings forth a crop, it's either snatched away by the ravens or it's choked by the thorns or it lands on the stony ground and it never takes root. The Lord wants us to nurture the truth. Admit it's the truth. Even if you don't know how you're going to follow the truth, admit it's the truth. Say, Lord, I know this is your will. Please help me to embrace the truth and acknowledge the truth. It's when you start putting it off and out of your mind, look what happens next. The verse continues, 2 Thessalonians 2, 11 and 12. For this cause, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned, lost, perished, who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Because they had pleasure in unrighteousness, God will allow them to come to a place where they are sincerely believing a lie. Many of those who worship the beast in the image in the last days, they're going to think the beast is right. They have rejected the truth, so they've come to the place where they believe a lie. You know, even the Apostle Paul, when he was killing Christians, he was sincere. He was wrong, dead wrong. Very religious, very zealous, very wrong. And if he hadn't repented, he would have been very lost. But he did repent. And a lot of people are deceived because they listen to the wrong spiritual advisors. That's why all through the seminar, we tell people, read the Bible. 
We put the verses on the screen. We sit down and take your Bible questions afterward. We are not afraid of the Word of God. We want you to follow this book because that's where the real freedom comes from. And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds are evil and because of their love for unrighteousness and they find pleasure in unrighteousness, they reject the light. And if you reject light, what do you have? Darkness. And if you're walking in the darkness, you've got the blind leading the blind. And that describes much of the religious world and yes, even much in the Christian world today. You've got blind guides leading the blind. You've got preachers out there telling people that if they just send more money to their ministry that they're going to get whatever they want. As though that's the purpose of Christianity, that Jesus is some kind of genie in a bottle and if you put your money in the envelope, then he's got to give you what you want. That's not what Christianity is. Uh, Jesus said, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. He wants us to follow him, his holy li uh, life example. Will those who persecute God's people in the last days believe they're doing the right thing? Yes, the time is coming when those who kill you will think they're doing service to God. Yeah, Paul, we just described, was very sincere. How did Peter describe those who have learned the truth but refuse to follow it? He said, for it would have been better, 2 Peter chapter 2, 21 and 22, it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they've known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it's happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog has turned to his own vomit again and the sow, the pig that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. How sad after a person hears a series of messages like this on the gospel to say, that's interesting. I talk to people after a message. Sometimes I meet them at the door. It always worries me when they say, well, that's very interesting. I don't want you to know if you are interested. I want to know, did you accept it as truth? Are you wanting to bring your life into line with God's commandments? Are you committed to following Christ? And a commitment, God's looking for total commitment. It's like that story of the, uh, the chicken and the pig. We're so thankful the farmer was so nice, fed them every day. The chicken said, we ought to do something special for the farmer. And the pig said, what do you have in mind? And the chicken said, well, why don't we make him a bacon and eggs breakfast? And the pig said, well, for you, it's a donation. For me, it's total commitment. And that's what God wants. He wants total commitment from us where we take up our cross. When you take up a cross, where do you go? Your crucifixion. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. I die daily, but then you're born again every day. You're a new creature. But this is what it means to be a Christian, to die to self and to live unto God. Jesus said that's where the secret for joy is. People think that the purpose in life is happiness. The purpose in life is holiness. In seeking after holiness, a byproduct is happiness. But if you make your happiness the goal, Jesus said if you seek to save your life, you'll lose it. But if you lose your life, give it to God then you'll find it. If you want to find your life, you surrender everything to God and then you will find real fulfillment. He says, I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. But that only comes when you deny yourself and take up your cross and follow Jesus. And when you do that, follow his word and follow Jesus, then you find the full life. You find joy. You've got everlasting life. What can make you happier than that? You have nothing to be afraid of. Christ is with you. You've got the fulfilled, abundant Christian life. So sad when you see people that know those things, they turn away from Christ back to the world. Does following Jesus involve some struggle and self-denial? Yeah. Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. I'm telling you, friends, that if pastors say all you got to do is say this little prayer at the altar, you're going to have everlasting life, and there's no struggle involved, they are misleading you. It is unscriptural. The Bible says there are battles in the Christian life. We struggle. We wrestle. These are biblical words. We strive. We fight. We war. We run. In the Christian life, there's effort involved in being a Christian. There's effort involved in life in anything, anything good. There is self-denial. There is self-control. You say, but I'm weak. The Holy Spirit will make you strong. Whatever you lack, Jesus will give you if you ask him. And so you, God will never ask you to do something without giving you the power to do it. Now, there's a wonderful promise. 
And if you fail once or twice, don't get discouraged. Get back up. He that endures to the end. That means don't get discouraged if you fall. Get back up. Hang on to Jesus. And you will make it to the kingdom. Question 16. Is it safe to procrastinate or to postpone a decision to follow Jesus? Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. When God calls you, that's the best time. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? We don't want to neglect it. The devil, a lot of people, they put it off. In the days of Noah, I think there were probably a lot of people who thought, yeah, it is a wicked world, and I wouldn't be surprised if God isn't planning to destroy it. And, and when I see the rain come, I'm going to get on that ark. But by the time the rain came, it was too late. So the time to get on is when the door is open. Noah stood in the door and he pled with people, get on board. And they said, well, the sky's clear now. I'm not getting on board now. Now's not a good time. I've still got plans. When the rain comes and the sky is dark, then I'll get on board. I meet Christians all the time. They say, I'm not fully committed, but when I see these final events of prophecy, then I'm going to get serious. Well, at that time, it may be too late. By the time the rain came, the door was shut. So the best time is now. Behold, now is the accepted day. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Jesus stands at the door and he's knocking now. What benefits come as a result of accepting and following the truth? Such promises, friends. Psalm 119, verse 165. Great peace have they which love thy law. Nothing will offend them. A person who loves the law of the Lord, he is like a tree planted by the rivers of water whose leaf will not fail. We have nothing to be afraid of. You will, God will prosper you when you put God's kingdom first and obedience first. It says you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. If the Son will make you free, you will be free indeed. It is wonderful to be free from the guilt, to be free from the fear of what's going to happen when I die. You have nothing to be afraid of. You have no guilt, no shame, no fear when you're born again because Jesus has set you free. He came to give that to you. He came to give you a joy unspeakable and peace that passes understanding. Seeing then that you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, we can have power. How do we do it? Through the Spirit, we can obey the truth. Question 18. What question did Jesus ask Peter three times? You remember, Peter denied Jesus three times. Then later after the resurrection, Peter met Jesus by the Sea of Galilee and, and he asked him three times, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And he said, if you love me, feed my sheep. In other words, do my will. I've called you to work for me. If you love me, do what I'm calling you to do. Friends, do you love the Lord? If you love the Lord, then you'll be wanting to go through the door that Jesus has created for you. Jesus told Peter, he said, uh, if you love me, surrender. Take up your cross and follow me. And Peter did. He lived the rest of his life for the Lord. Christ told him that same day, he said, when you were young, you clothed yourself and went where you wanted. You did your own thing. But now when you're old, someone else is going to clothe you and you will stretch forth your hands. Peter was arrested by Nero after a long and fruitful life serving Jesus. He could have denied his faith, but he refused and he knew he'd be crucified. Now, Paul was beheaded because he was a Roman citizen. They'd execute you quickly. Peter was not, so he was to be crucified. And he made one request of the emperor. He said, I'm not worthy to die like my Lord. Will you please crucify me with my head down? And they complied. He probably died quicker because of that. But Peter was so uh, bold for Jesus later in his life. He never forgot the time that he had denied Christ. And he says, I am glad I can lay down my life and share in his sufferings. Friends, do you love Jesus? You know, he has come to this earth and he's made a road to make it possible for us to serve him. I'd like to close by sharing with you a story I think that you're going to find uh, inspiring. True story. Back in 1960, Dashrath Manji was a, a poor, humble man. I've made several trips to India. Karen and I were there about a year ago. And uh, lovely people there. Some of them are very poor. This man lived in a village that was about 45 miles to the nearest clinic. There was actually a shortcut, but the problem was you couldn't take the shortcut because it went over a steep, rocky cliff, it was three miles, and, and uh, 
Nobody could get by. One day his wife, beautiful young wife, became ill with, um, it wasn't a serious illness if he could get her to the clinic. But because of the terrible road and the long journey to the clinic, by the time she got there, she had died. He was absolutely brokenhearted. He loved her so much and she was such a beautiful wife and a good wife that uh, he could never recover from the grieving. And he became angry. And he said, you know, I never want anyone else to suffer what I've suffered. If the government had only put a road through this mountains, instead of 45 miles to the hospital, it would be three miles to where all the shopping and these schools are for our children. And, and they pled with the government and the government said, uh, no, we've we got other priorities. We're not going to worry about that. And Manji got out there one day and people thought he lost his noodle. He got a hammer and a chisel and he went out to this rock wall that was mountain that was blocking the way and he began to chisel against it. And he chiseled and shoveled and chiseled, beat out and wore out many chisels, many hammers. Day after day, people thought that he, he'd gone crazy, but they saw how persistent he was. And when they asked him, he says, you know, I love my wife. It broke my heart. I don't want anyone else to have a broken heart because they can't get to the hospital. They can't get their children to school. He said, if no one's going to do it, I'm going to do it. And he spent the next 22 years, day after day, with a chisel, with a hammer, until he had hammered a road through the mountain 25 feet wide, 360 feet long. And there's a picture of it today. He's now a national hero. You know, it just, uh, it's moving to think what one man would do to create a door, a gateway, so that people could find salvation. Jesus left the portals of heaven to move mountains, to create a way for you to be with him in the kingdom because he loves you. He does not want you to be lost, friends. But you need to make a decision to come to him just like you are. God the Father so loved the world. He so loved you that he gave his son that whosoever believes in him, and that means be lives in him, might not perish, but have everlasting life. What could be worth more than everlasting life? And you know, before we close this service, I want to give you an opportunity today, now, to make a decision. If you've not made a decision before, then we're going to encourage you to do that right now. Uh, you will see a decision card questions on your screen. Some of you have these questions in... Uh, in your uh, program you're doing. And we're pulling out a card we used earlier. It says, my decision for Christ. Basically, this is saying you want to make a decision and you want to make it today for total commitment to follow Jesus. Not like Peter from a distance, but to now follow him all the way, wherever he le leads. We got four questions here that have some specific uh, information. And I want to pray for you before we uh, ask these questions. Father, as your spirit has been striving in the hearts of these people, as they've been listening to this series, right now, I pray you'll give them courage and victory to step out in faith, to believe, and to make decisions to surrender to Jesus and be part of his people. All right, here are the questions. And keep in mind, between now and the break time, you, when we come back with Bible answers, you can go to the website, Revelation Now, and you can fill out your card online. I hope you'll do that for me so that I can pray for you. Question one. I do not want to receive the mark of the beast. We've been talking about the battle in the last days that is just before us, and you know what you do not want. Mark that. Second question. I surrender to the Holy Spirit, and I commit my life 100% to Jesus, above family, friends, churches, work, anything. If you say, I want to put Jesus first in my life, I want to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Mark that. You may have done it before. Do it again, because every time you do that, it strengthens your resolve to follow Christ. Third question, specific now. You want to be part of God's people? I choose to worship Jesus in spirit and truth and become part of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We've been telling you about this movement. God is calling people from all over back to this Bible-based movement, and he's inviting you to be part of the family. Yes, he's got people in many churches, but Jesus said, other sheep I've got, they're not of this fold, but they'll hear my voice, how through his word, there'll be one fold and one shepherd. And if you hear God calling, you know you need to be baptized, be part of his people. Before Jesus comes, that's an important decision. Please mark that. And then the last question, 
if you're praying about this and you've got some questions you'd like to ask and you want someone to help you or to study further, mark that last box. Put your information on your card when you mark it online. We will contact you. We'll do our best to follow up, to pray for you. And even by making this decision now, just between you and Jesus, that'll be registered in heaven that you've made that decision. You know, friends, uh, this series is all about getting you into the kingdom. And we want to pray that each of you can be in that kingdom. God has a place for you there. I know there's struggles involved, but I've never known anybody that was sorry that they said yes to Jesus. So I pray that's your decision right now. We're going to have prayer together. We're coming back for our last session answering Bible questions. We're going to talk about some of the very important ones. So let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the, the joy we've had in this uh, Revelation Now program as we've studied together, sharing the Word of God. I know the Word is not going to return void, but it's transforming hearts and lives everywhere. And we pray that's the case again today. We know that Jesus came to open a door and he stands at the door. In Revelation, Lord, you've told us you stand at the door and knock. You said, if any man hears my voice, speaking through your word, and opens that door, that you will come into them and sup with them. Right now, Lord, I pray all those listening and watching will open the door and invite Jesus into their hearts as a permanent resident. Bless us now in the days that follow that we can draw closer to you and even in the question time that will follow. We thank you and pray in Christ's name. Amen. Now don't go away, friends. We'll be right back and answer a few very important Bible questions. Hello, friends. We're here in the Philippines overlooking the Tahal Volcano and Lake which is one of the most interesting pieces of geography in the whole world. For one thing, this great caldera was once the biggest volcano in the world, and now it holds a lake that holds another volcano that has another little lake in it that has another little island in it. This volcano has erupted six times in a major way since the 1500s. And even in 1911, there was an eruption where over 1,300 people died killed by the smoke and the ash that covered the community. There were tsunamis that came from the lake and destroyed the villages that surrounded the borders of the lake. In fact, this is one of the most carefully monitored seismic places in the Philippines. This volcano is being watched all the time. And they've noticed as of 2006 that it appears that the water temperatures are going up. There's increased seismic activity. In other words, they know that this volcano is a ticking time bomb prepared to blow. And it's very interesting because this place is a place of great seismic activity, but in spite of the fact that volcanologists know this is gonna blow again someday, it is a popular tourist destination. They're fighting for the real estate. They're building like mad and sit on the edge of disaster. It makes us think about how God has given us so many warnings in his word that the world is gonna end, that Jesus is gonna come, that the heavens will dissolve with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Seeing then that all these things will be dissolved, what kind of people should we be in all holy conversation and godliness? Friends, are you becoming distracted with the tranquil views of the world or are you preparing for the next world? Are you getting ready for the Big Bang? Hello, friends. We'd like to welcome you back to Revelation Now. This is our final time to take your Bible questions, at least on this program. Of course, it's not the final time that we'll take Bible questions. We do have a program, Pastor Doug, every Sunday evening called right. Bible Answers Live. It's a radio program. Folks can also participate through the Internet, through mm -hmm. Facebook. And um, yes, if you have a Bible question, you can join us every Sunday evening, 7 p.m. Pacific time, uh, with mm -hmm. your Bible question, but we are taking questions here as part of this Revelation series. We've had That's some right. great questions that have come in, and we really do appreciate this. Um, so let's get to our questions, Pastor. Right. We've got one question we'll put up on the screen. It says, what if I cannot afford to pay tithe? Will God still bless me? Well, you know, paying tithe is uh, really a step of faith. And if you're waiting until you feel like you can always afford it, the devil might try and arrange things so you never think you can. 
It doesn't make sense, but uh, nine-tenths will go farther than ten-tenths. God says if we're faithful to return our tithe, he blesses the other 90% so that it goes farther. And, uh, yeah, if we're faithful in those things, you've got to step out in faith. God will bless you. Mm -hmm. The Bible tells about a woman. She actually gave her last two mites. And Jesus, he, uh, he blessed her because she put God first. So if we're faithful in that, uh, he'll bless what's left. We also have the example in the Old Testament about the widow who gave her last uh, little loaf of bread to the prophet. And, of course, she was blessed. The flour didn't fail, and they were able to the feed oil, the family. Yeah, the for oil, yeah, there. Yep. That's right. Okay, well, we're ready for a question. We'll take a few uh, questions on the screen in just a moment, but let me get to some of these that came in. Somebody's asking, why is it that God only puts his mark on the forehead and not on the hand of people who believe in him? Well, the difference is with the mark of the beast, it's hand or forehead because it, some will be sincerely worshiping the beast and think it's true. Some may not worship, but they will do it with their hands, their actions. They say, well, I'm going to serve the beast I, even though I don't agree. Either one, whether you're doing it sincerely or you're doing it to try to be able to buy and sell. But with those who are saved, it is not by our works we're saved. It is only by our worship and our faith. Okay. Another question that we have dealing with Bible prophecy, it's Pastor Doug, can you explain the phrase, Babylon is fallen, is fallen? What does that mean? Yeah, and you, you might want to help me with this, but the way I understand it is you've got Babylon falling in the days of um, uh, Daniel when the Persians overthrew it. So Babylon fell then, but Babylon also is going to fall spiritually. And then also even in Revelation, Babylon fell when the beast received a deadly wound, mm -hmm. but then it falls again. Yes. And so there's multiple fallings. They got the Tower of Babel that fell. But when it repeats fallen and fallen, it means not getting up this time. Yes, it's also interesting to note Revelation 17, you have the woman, her name is Babylon, but it says she has daughters as well. Those would be those churches that are holding yeah. to the teachings of the mother church. There is the fall of the mother church, but there's, there's also the fall of the daughter churches. So you yeah. have Babylon fallen, the mother church, Babylon falls, the daughter churches. That's right. All right, um, another question that we have, this is an interesting one. Uh, why was the furnace heated seven times hotter? And they're referring to um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Any significance to the number seven? Well, I think there is. Um, first of all, I'm not sure that they had an a adequate thermometer to measure exactly seven times. I think Nebuchadnezzar, when he commanded them to heat it seven times hotter than it was heated, for melting gold, you don't need it as hot like lead. You, know, you don't need it as hot as melting iron or some other metals. And uh, so they really did get it a lot hotter than it normally had been. Mm -hmm. um, but the number seven really is talking about um, a complete cycle of something. When it tells us that Jesus was with the three Hebrews in the fiery furnace, even though it was seven times hotter, that's saying that as hot as the devil can make it, he can still protect you mm -hmm. yeah, the maximum it's also interesting to know with the three hebrews in the fiery furnace christ was with them in the fire it was seven times hotter but it resulted in them being delivered not even with the smell of smoke so likewise we know god's people at the end of time will be purged so to speak in the fire but they shall come forth completely delivered cleansed of sin the only so thing burned is the ropes that bind us that's right the and sins. jesus who we, the trial sometimes burn the ropes that's right <laughs> So there's an interesting, a good analogy there. Mm -hmm. um, Pastor Doug, is there any significance to the fourth angel in Revelation, four, uh, Revelation 18? It talks about an angel coming down from heaven. Earth is illuminated with his glory. Yeah. The, uh, the message of Babylon falling, which is the second angel's message in Revelation 14, it went out with great power oh, 150 years ago. People were being called into the remnant church. But it's going to go again in a greater power even. The whole heavens are illuminated with the message in the last days. And I think we're on the verge of that now. Through media like this and the internet, this message, I, I hear it everywhere. It's going all over the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the loud voice. Yeah. And after the angel gives the message, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Then it says, I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people. Mm -hmm. So it is interesting to note that God's got faithful people still in Babylon. When the message is preached, then Jesus calls them to come out. Yeah. And Christ said, the time will come when there'll be one fold and one shepherd. So other sheep I have that are on others fold. So Christ is going to call them out. I think we're seeing the fulfillment of that even today as mm -hmm. there's this revival of truth going around it's the world. It's happening, yes. It's exciting. Okay, another question that we have. It says, Revelation 
all of the world wanders after the beast. Uh, what does this mean for those who are not Christian? Well, if you're not Christian, you've got other problems. Uh, it won't help you to even know the answer. <laughs> I guess <laughs> but, so. Um, it's saying that people in the world that uh, have no interest in God or spiritual things, they will naturally think it's a wonderful thing. Mm. They'll think that it's, uh, they're doing the good thing by following the laws of the beast. They'll say, isn't it the best thing for everybody, for humanism, for the planet, the environment? I think you're probably going to hear environmental excuses for worshiping right. the beast. Right. You're going to hear economic excuses. You're going to hear social environmental excuses. They're going to have all kinds of great arguments other than the word of God. And uh, yeah. if, they'll be able to rationalize everything back then, okay. or in the future, rather. All right, well, we have another question we'll put up on the screen. This one is, if I keep the Sabbath, I may lose my job. Doesn't God want, doesn't God want me to support my family? Well, yeah, the Lord does want us to be faithful, but as we mentioned in the presentation, our first priority is to Christ. And you think about when... Uh, when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, we're not bowing down to the image, uh, they were going to lose their lives. They were going to lose their jobs. <laughs> so in the last days, you say, uh, the best thing I can do for my family is set an example of putting God first and then trust the Lord. You know, let me just, I can tell you many miracles. I once really, young family, really had a job I needed. One of the only jobs in this town was for a lumber mill, and I was going to be hired on to work for the lumber mill. But they said, you know, for the first six months, you're going to have to work Sabbaths. I was a new Sabbath keeper, and I said, oh, man, just six months. I mean, God will understand if I do it for six months. I was telling myself that, and then I realized, no, if it's wrong, it's wrong. I shouldn't do it. Once I start breaking, compromising like that, I'm in trouble. And I said, no. And the guy said, you're crazy. I got you a job. Everybody wants this job. You got a job. I've got to, you go get the medical. It's yours. You just for six months, you got to work, you know, this shift. I said, I can't do it. He, was, he thought I was very ungrateful. And some people said I was crazy. Well, it turns out within a couple of days, I got a job with better hours, didn't have to work Sabbath, working for the logging trucks, not the mill, logging trucks. And I was able to get every Sabbath off. Mm -hmm. And they'd even let me go home Friday afternoon to sundown. So I stood up for the Lord and he honored. And I know a lot of people, they tell their boss, I can't work Sabbaths anymore. They'll sell, you'll lose your job. And you say, well, I've got to keep God's commandments. A lot of bosses start thinking, this guy's so honest that he's willing to lose his job rather than disobey. He's probably not stealing from me. And they find a way to keep him. And uh, in North America, there's usually a lot of laws that will also protect your rights of worship. So put God first, friends. Okay. All right, somebody's asking, if I'm in conversation with a person and they take God's name in vain, should I say something to them or should I just keep silent? Well, it depends on your relationship. I, I don't think every time you're, you know, in public, you're going to hear that all the time. If you're correcting everybody in public who's using God's name in vain, uh, you're not going to last very long. Uh, I, I think that if you've got a relationship with somebody and you, they're doing that and you say, you know, brother or sister, yeah, I'm a Christian. And when I hear you use God's name in vain, it just makes me cringe. Could I ask you to try not to do that and... And they'll probably, you know, if they're friends at all, it's, if they're being respectful, unless they're being really ugly and ornery, they'll say, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize it offended you. I'll, I'll see if I could curb my tongue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, sometimes I, you, you and I play racquetball with some guys, and they sometimes use uh, some pretty amazing language. <laughs> and uh, once or twice, I don't do it in front of everyone. When I get them by themselves, I say, you know, I'm a pastor, and when you say those things, it kind of makes me cringe. They say, oh, I'm sorry, I'll see what I can do. And they'll usually try to accommodate I don't make a big deal out of it, but I let them know that uh, I let them know those are God and that they are accountable for how they use his name. Right. And, you know, it's, it's interesting, Pastor Doug, when people spend time around a Christian, uh, even without saying anything, over time their language begins to change. Yeah. I've even had people, I haven't said a word, they don't even know I'm a Christian, but I've been meeting with people, interacting with them, and they might say something, and they'll turn to me and apologize. Say, oh, I'm sorry. It's as if they realize yeah. that what they are saying is not right. And even the guys we play racquetball with, sometimes they'll say to us, oh, sorry, Pastor. Yeah, <laughs> they, that's they, right. Something <laughs> slips. <laughs> right, they, they, right. They're convicted. Yep. So it's kind of nice to see how the Holy Spirit speaks to people's hearts. Yeah. All right. Here's an interesting question. Can you remove the mark of the beast once you've received it? No, and there ain't no eraser for that. <laughs> I think once we get to the point where it's a critical issue, 
Uh, and, you know, I think a person, once they embrace it, um, I don't see evidence in the Bible that they're going to be able to waffle back and forth. Um, mm -hmm. Once probation closes anyway, That's then right. there's no change right. at that point. And of course, probation doesn't close until Revelation chapter 7, you have the seal of the living God placed upon those who are faithful to God. Mm -hmm. Well, then by default, the mark of the beast will be on everyone else. At that point, And once yeah. that happens, probation closes. So there's only two groups at the very end. Yeah. All right, another question that we have, it says, in the Bible, and the person says, I'm not sure where, but in the Bible it says God was jealous. Uh, I thought jealousy was not a good thing. I don't understand this. No, uh, well, envy is not a good thing. That's listed as one of the seven deadly sins, or covetousness. That means wanting what another person has. Jealous for something that you have a right to. Um, if, if someone is mistreating your spouse, or if someone is trying to steal their affections, that is a perfectly normal God-given desire. You're in a covenant with that person. There's an exclusive relationship, and it is normal for you to feel like that's being invaded by another person. That's how God feels when the devil is trying to take our affections from God. Mm -hmm. That's a per perfectly normal, appropriate emotion. As a matter of fact, it's inappropriate if you don't care. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if somebody is mistreating or trying to steal the affection that belongs to you from your spouse, your children, that should cause a righteous indignation. And so that's all God is saying is, I'm jealous for you. And God is our parent, and the devil is trying to steal the affection of God's children. Yeah. No wonder God is jealous over us yeah. with a godly jealousy. And so. he knows that the devil has bad intentions, too. Right, absolutely. All right, we're going to put up another question on the screen. This one is, if my wife is not ready to make a Christian commitment, should I wait for her? Well, if you're saying, I want to get baptized and join the church, and your wife is saying, you know, give me another month because my family can join us and I'd like to do it together, that makes sense. But if you've got a spouse and they're saying, I'm not sure I want to follow Jesus, I'm not sure I want to get baptized and, and be part of his people, you need to take, a, take your stand. And that's probably one of the most important things you could do in sending a message to your spouse, your loved ones, your family, your children, if you have children is for you to put Jesus first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Somebody's asking, uh, we might have touched on this before, but it's probably worth repeating. Can someone be baptized more than once? Yes. And um, you, there's three reasons for rebaptism. One is if a person is not baptized biblically by immersion, maybe they were sprinkled or poured or something, you should be baptized like Christ was. Second reason for rebaptism is if you completely divorced yourself from the Lord, you stop going to church, you kind of renounce your Christian faith and live in the world, if you're going to return to the Lord, you should probably get rebaptized. Now, that doesn't mean that you, you get upset and you miss church for a few weeks. That's the purpose for uh, the communion service. Mm -hmm. But if you really renounce the Lord, uh, you may need to get a new beginning. If Legally, if I were to divorce Karen and we live apart for a year, if I wanted to be married to her again, I got to go through another marriage. And so that would be the case for rebaptism there. Third reason is in Acts 19, you read about these 12 Ephesian men. They had, there's so much they had missed about the life and ministry of Jesus that when Paul shared all that with them, he said, you need to be rebaptized. Even though they had been baptized by immersion, by John the Baptist, worshiping the right God, they had just missed so many things about the life and ministry and teachings of Jesus. They were rebaptized and filled with the Holy Spirit. So that would be the other time. I know people... I had a Baptist minister, came to a series like this, and at the end he said, Pastor Doug, I, don't want, I want to be rebaptized. I said, Brother, you're a Baptist. You got baptized by immersion. He said, Yeah, I got baptized into nine commandments. I want to get baptized into all ten. So he was rebaptized, and he didn't regret it. All right, very good. Here's another question. It says, How do I increase my prayer skills? Well, how do you increase your music performance you know, on the piano? Mm -hmm. As a practice. And the more time you spend talking to the Lord, the better you get at it. Um, I find that my preaching is a little better now than it was when I was 19 years old. Because the more you do something, the better you get at it, the more comfortable you become at it. Uh, and you get to know the person you're talking to better. So continue to pray. Read the prayers in the Bible. That's another great exercise. Look at the prayers in the Bible. Read the prayer of Hannah. Read the prayer of Daniel. Read the prayers in the New Testament a prayer of, of uh, Simeon, and there's some beautiful prayers in the Bible that follow a pattern. Jesus didn't say just repeat the Lord's Prayer. He said pray in this manner. The Lord's Prayer is an outline for prayer. 
But look at some of the other great prayers in the Bible. The prayer of Solomon dedicating the temple, wonderful prayer. It'll teach you about putting God first, glorifying him, so forth. We do have a book called Teach Us to Pray. Yeah. And it's available uh, at the Amazing Facts website, just amazingfacts.org. And it's got those principles that you mentioned. It's yes, outlining that little absolutely. book. Absolutely. All right, here's an interesting question. This is Luke 13, verse 32. And the person he's asking, what does this verse mean? I'll read it. And he said unto them, Jesus speaking, Go tell that fox, behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today, tomorrow, and the third day I'll be perfected. Yeah, Jesus is calling Herod a fox. Herod at this point had executed John the Baptist. So messengers came to Jesus and said, Herod is, chances he's going to do to you what he did to John the Baptist. Christ said, go tell him, I teach, do cures, cast out devils today, tomorrow, the third day I'll be completed, perfected. Jesus used a day for a year principle in this prophecy. He taught three more years mm -hmm. and fulfilled his ministry. And Jesus even was tried by Herod in his trial. He had nothing to say to Herod. Herod said, do a miracle, do a cure, cast out a devil. He said, you rejected John the Baptist. If you rejected him, you rejected me. So in essence, his probation had closed by that yeah. time. All right, very good. You know, Pastor Doug, before we, we'll see if we have time for another question, but we do want to let people know about a free offer. The study guide for today for our Revelation Now series is entitled, No Turning Back. If you'd like to receive this, just text the word TURN to 40544 and you'll be able to receive a digital download of the study guide, or you can just download it at the Revelation Now website, just revelationnow.com. Now, Pastor Doug, in the last uh, few little uh, seconds that remain, we want to tell folks about how they can continue their study of God's Word. And we're very excited to offer something we've never done before, and that is one of our AFCO online um, courses. It's mm -hmm. called Amazing Disciples. And for every, anyone who's watching, uh, we'll make this available for about seven days, uh, you can actually enroll for free in the Amazing Facts AFCO Amazing Doctrines course. To do that, just visit online.afco.org. You can also find that link at the Revelation, or rather the Amazing Facts website. You select the Amazing Doctrines course. We have a special code, and you can type that in, rev lowercase now which will give you access, access to that uh, program, and you'll be blessed. There are weekly Zoom meetings. There's Facebook Live classes. You'll have uh, classes with Pastor Doug, myself, the rest of our AFCO staff, and some guest teachers. Uh, it's just a great experience to reinforce mm -hmm. these uh, wonderful yeah. truths that you've been learning during your time here at Revelation. So we encourage you to take advantage of that. Also, we have our free uh, Amazing Facts correspondence course, and that is available to anyone it's online, so you don't have to be in North America Absolutely. to be a part of it. You can just enroll, and you can study these wonderful truths. Amen. Well, friends, we're about out of time for the Revelation Now program. We trust that you've been blessed. We hope that your life has been transformed for the better as a result. And we encourage you to continue studying. Take advantage of the Amazing Facts website. You'll see that we have a lot of other uh, associate websites connected with that to get more information because... Jesus is coming very soon, friends. We want to get ready, get ready, get ready, and share the good news with others so we're ready when he comes. So continue your study. God bless.